Hello again, everybody. It's Scott Casper, Takedown Media. Our conversation on the sport continues today. We head to Singapore, which is uh, just just off Malaysia, to talk with Heath Sims, our guest in the Nike hot seat today. Heath, welcome back. How are you, my brother? How are you? Yeah, I'm doing really good. Thanks for having me. Let's talk a little bit about Singapore. First of all, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty big step from uh, Washington or Oregon as it were, California, leaving there and moving all the way to Singapore. How did that happen? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a far move. It, um, it happened actually rather quickly. The um, Evolve Mixed Martial Arts, which is the largest gym out here in, uh, in Asia, um, they had a very successful Muay Thai program, had a very successful uh, jiu-jitsu program, but they don't have much wrestling out here. So um, they were looking for a wrestling-based um, coach who could also be MMA coach. And uh, they struggled, actually, for a long time looking for uh, a coach that fit, the, uh, fit what they needed. And one of my friends contacted me about the position, uh, mainly just to know if I knew anybody that would, would uh, be interested so I, um, I started contacting some people, and then I started to realize that, wow, that sounds like a, uh, a great position. It sounds like something that, you know, could possibly be good for me. <laughs> right. So, um, so then I, um, I got in touch uh, with Chatri Sidiatong, the founder of Evolve, and uh, I had um, two phone calls with him, and you know, just an amazing guy, a great vision for MMA in Asia, and uh, he's a, a Harvard MBA, um, so he's a, a you know, really well-successful uh, businessman, and, um, you know, I, I um, just thought it was a great opportunity to work with some great people, do something different in another part of the world, and um, about, I think, two weeks after my, my first conversation with him, I had two bags packed, and I was on a plane, and I was heading to Singapore. Now what happens there? You have to sell all your stuff here stateside and, and or just leave it behind or what? I I sold most of my stuff and then I gave away some stuff and then I kind of packed away some things I didn't need. It's amazing what you don't need when deciding to move, isn't it? <laughs> oh, man, I'll tell you, it's actually, it's awesome. You know how <laughs> nice it was to move with like, two bags of clothes and not have anything I had to worry about. <laughs> when I moved to Singapore, all I needed to do was buy a bike and, uh, I was set. <laughs> so what is Singapore like compared to the United States? Um, well, Singapore is only about 50 years old. It's, um, it's, uh, very small. There's 6 million people, about 6 million people that live here. Um, it's very clean. It's very safe. It's uh, very modern. Uh, it's very multicultural, um, so it's um, you know it's just I, I like to tell people it's just a it's an easy place to live. Like I don't have a car; I ride my bike most of the time. Wow. Um, I um, you know it's mostly apartment living here because the housing is very exp expensive. To own a car is very expensive, um, but everything else is is reasonable. And, um, you know, the people here, like I said, you, you meet people from all over the world that have moved here to live or to visit. And, um, you know, for me, someone that's spent most of their life traveling and meeting people from all over the world, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's great. It's a, it makes it a, a, nice, a nice place to live. We're talking with the former San Clemente Jets uh, wrestler. He wrestled under Bob Anderson there at San Clemente. Uh, are you always a Jet once you've been a Jet? Yeah, of course. Uh, There's such a such a good group of guys there with Bob Anderson. You know, and like I like I told you, I'm uh, very fortunate to meet Bob at a young age and have him take uh, take me under his wing and be able to wrestle with all the the best guys at the time. Um, you know, it's just that's all my success came from being uh, involved with the Jets. Coach Anderson really opened up doors for you in freestyle and Greco. You obviously uh, gravitated toward Greco. Why? 
Um, it happened to be because uh, Gogi Parsegian, who was uh, one of our coaches at the Jets, he was training for the Nationals for the World Championships, and uh, he'd bring in Anthony Amato, he'd bring in some Russian trainers and wrestlers, and all of a sudden I had a situation where I'm wrestling with some of the best guys in the world in Greco. I, I was just a 16, 17-year-old kid, but I had some of the best coaching available. Right. And uh, I learned so fast just having that, um, having, having that, you know, f- for myself that at a very young age, I, um, I excelled pretty fast in Greco. I ended up taking second on the world team trial ladder when I was 18 years old. And uh, this was 1990. And I was two years away from uh, the Olympics in 92. So I'm thinking, wow, I got two years. I'm the number two guy. All I got to do is beat one guy, and I'm going to make an Olympic team. So I, uh, I was like, I'm just going to keep doing this Greco stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're, you're obviously uh, at the root of it all. Let's face it. Uh, you were there at the beginning of Greco for Team USA, uh, or one of the early uh, competitors anyway, uh, along with Steve and others. Um, Greco is, is, is finding a newfound, uh, popularity here in the States. What's it like in Singapore? Um, there, there is wrestling here. I, um, I work with some of the, the Singapore wrestling federation. Um, we actually teach, uh, one, I teach one of the classes at the gym once a week and, um, it's, um, it's actually very interesting. Um, the Singapore wrestling federation started here. Um, I think it was probably about eight years ago. They brought Sergei Beliglazov here, and he was the head coach for two years. Wow. And they built a beautiful facility, and they started a wrestling program here because they, they had nothing. And um, he was here for, I think, three or four years, and then they lost their funding, and he left. And now they, they still have a program, but it's um, – you know, it's struggling. It's new. There's a lot of up and coming young wrestlers. Um, just not a lot of opportunities for them, and there's not a lot of competitions for them. But, but nonetheless, at Evolve, mixed martial arts, they realize how important wrestling is to mixed martial arts, right? Yeah, and that was the main thing that you know for for the Evolve Fight Team, they had. Um, you know, fighters that were very good in jiu-jitsu, some jiu-jitsu black belts that were fighters. They had some Muay Thai fighters that transitioned over. But they didn't have they didn't have the wrestling, so they were kind of missing that component. So they uh, that's why they they were looking for a wrestling based MMA coach. So I, I came over to help fill that void. Let's go back to 1989, Heath, if we can. You were a national team member in 89 and a world team member in 1990. After that, it seemed as almost as if the wheels came off. Can you describe what happened in your life at that point? Um, yeah, no, actually, 1990, yeah, yeah, I ended up, like I said, taking second to Andy Sarris at the world team trials. I was 18 years old. Um, and this was a year after high school. I graduated high school, and I decided to... Um, not go to college right away. I, I had a year to just travel. I went with Dan Henderson and with the Jets, and we went to Europe. We lived in Russia. We trained with the Olympic Russian wrestling team at their Olympic training center. I mean, it was just you couldn't ask for a better situation to learn Greco-Roman. So I went over there. I spent a year traveling and training, and then I came back, and you know, and I lost to Andy Sarris in the finals. And... Um, um, you know, after that, I was like, well, I'm not going to, I'm just going to take classes at college and I'm going to continue wrestling Greco. There's not really any reason for me to go to college, um, to wrestle in college. So I, um, I continued training and, um, through, uh, the next year I ended up taking fourth at the Olympic team tri- or at the world team trials. Um, and I just continued training and, uh, you know, tried to make the 92 Olympic team, you know, Obviously, that was the year Dan shocked a lot of people, right? Uh, and he made the Olympic team, um, but it was about about six months before I, I was having problems with my shoulders. They were subluxing on me, and and um, it just got to be really bad that I, I I 
I couldn't, I couldn't really wrestle because my shoulder would dislocate or sublex. And so I, I ended up just kind of pulling out of the trials and, uh, getting so- shoulder surgery and taking the time off and just saying, look, I'm just going to regroup and, uh, you know, come come back next year and see how things go. In in '96, you actually quit wrestling completely in order to work for a computer company. But overall, I'd say you missed the sport. Is that true? Well, yeah. You know, 1995 uh, was the first time I beat Andy Saris after losing to him for about I think 20 matches. He beat me at nationals, world team trials, international tournaments. He would beat me every every time. So at the uh, 95 World Team Trials, I um, I actually beat him for the first time to make the, the World Team. And uh, I, I competed at the World Championships. And then, um, you know, I was the number one ranked wrestler going into 96. Um, so I, I went to nationals. I lost in the semis in 96 um, to uh, Chris Saba. Who, another uh, world team member, really good wrestler. Lost to him. And I went from, I made weight at 150, and I ballooned up to about 189. Wow. Three days later. And I just kind of told myself, look, I can't, I can't make the weight anymore. I got to go up a weight class. So, you know, the, the Olympic trials was a month later. I, uh, I went up the weight class to 163. And... Uh, Still had a pretty hard time making the weight, actually. Um, ended up losing to uh, Gordy Morgan in the semifinals by a point. And, uh, you know, he's the one that ended up making the Olympic team that year. So, you know, it was um, a good experience. It was just not my year. You know, things didn't work out. And uh, after putting so much time into wrestling and so much sacrifice on other parts of my life, I just was like, I was kind of fed up and done with it. And that's when uh, I took a step back from wrestling and said, look, I'm going to kind of join the uh, corporate world and see what I can do here. And just started working, uh, you know, a regular nine to five job at a computer company and um, having fun. (laughs) But but uh, even, even as you dipped your toes into the, the, the corporate world, as it were, you've, you missed the competition. You began practicing again and, and finished third at the U.S. World Team Trials. I mean, dude, this is what we've been denied. We've been denied a, a healthy Heath Sims almost your entire career in, in Greco. And I'm wondering if we had had a healthy Heath Sims, where we would be now had you been healthy. Uh, you look at how you did coming out of, uh, you know, a semi-retirement, if you will, in 98 at the World Team Trials. And then we got dealt another blow in 99 when you flew your snowboard off a mountainside and it had to be transported via helicopter to hospital <laughs> with a kidney and spleen laceration. I mean, you, you almost literally lost your kidney. Yeah. You know, it, it was a funny thing cause I really convinced myself I didn't want to wrestle anymore. Um, and Dan, you know, I was living with Dan Henderson and he was coaching at Cerritos junior college and he approached me and said, Hey, why don't you come wrestle at, uh, Cerritos? And to me, I, I kind of laughed, like, what the hell? I want to go wrestle some junior <laughs> college sport. <You> know? <laughs> and uh, then I talked to the, uh, the head coach, and uh, he said, look, you can come here, um, you know, practice as much as you want. We can get you the classes you need to finish up your school. It won't cost you anything. It's nearby. You know, and I started thinking about it. I'm like, oh, yeah, maybe, okay, I'll do it, you know. So I, I went, and then I started training again, and. Then I fell back in love with the sport. I actually liked wrestling again. And I, I didn't just show up once in a while. I trained hard every day and really liked it and ended up winning the uh, California Junior National uh, title. And, uh, and I'm like, wow, well, I'm in shape. I'm, I'm wrestling again. I can, I can still do Greco. So then I started training Greco with a couple guys. And, yeah, then I went and ended up uh, taking third at the World Team Trials after spending probably six months training Greco. Um, and I, and I started enjoying wrestling more, you know, I wasn't putting as much pressure on myself. I wasn't, um, you know, I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was sacrificing everything in my life just to wrestle. So it made it more enjoyable. You realized at that point, is, is it fair to say you realized at that point you had options? 
there were there were things in life that were more important. So you started having fun with the sport, even coming back from the terrible injuries to your kidney and spleen. Uh, and, and you even defied doctor's orders and started wrestling again. And you went to the Olympic trials in the best of three finals. You, bre- you beat Chris Saba of Colorado Springs 5-2 in your first bout. Uh, Saba won the second, but you won the final 3-1. What was that moment like after all the, all the setbacks you've had in your career? You know, surely there's some positives as well, as well, but, you know, coming back and then winning the Olympic trials 3-1 uh, in your final match, what was that moment like for you? Well, it was, um, yeah, it was, it was probably one of the best moments in my wrestling career. You know, everything kind of came to a pinnacle at that point. I remember... I won the first match. I remember I lost the second match, and I really had I had uh, I had no worry, no stress, or anything. I was just like, look, I've already done everything. I, I spent my whole life wrestling and doing everything to prepare for this. Now it's just you know time to go do it. And it was it was a weird it was a weird calmness I had, or a weird kind of just enjoying the moment that I had that I usually never had when I was wrestling. And uh, I think it helped me wrestle better. And, um, you know, I ended up going out and, and beating Chris, which, you know, me and Chris went back and forth beating each other for years. You know, and he is one of the, you know, he's a very tough wrestler. Um, you know, and I, I think I just took a lot of pressure off myself and just really started doing, learned to love the sport. And it made me wrestle better. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's fair. That's fair because the observations, and if I remember right, my my recollections of you as a competitor, it seemed like you were having more fun in your senior years of wrestling, and I think that evolved too. Uh, and I think it's apparent in your your career in mixed martial arts as well. Uh, you know, I go back to you know Extreme Pancration Two in L.A. Uh, in 2002, where you defeated Steve Bruno by decision. In total, you had, what, 11 fights total in your MMA career? Uh, yeah, I, I, I had 11 fights. Um, you know, I, it, MMA was really kind of strange to me. I, You know, like I said, I was living with Dan Henderson, and at the time, uh, Randy started fighting, and then about a year later, Dan said, I'm going to do a fight in Brazil. I'm looking at him like, what the fuck are you talking about? Why would you do a fight in Brazil? And he's like, well, I can make money. You know, he's a we're poor wrestlers making you know thousand fifteen hundred dollars a month. He's like, I make fifteen grand. I'm like, well, shoot, go do it. So he uh, he started training, and I was like, oh, I'll train with you it's for fun. You know, I didn't know how to box. I didn't know how to submit. I didn't know anything. But it was it was so much fun to learn something different. You know, I wrestled and did the same thing over and over and over day after day. So all of a sudden you're all these new things start coming at you. You can punch, you can kick, you can grab this, you can roll this way. You can, you know, so, you know, training was actually fun. You're just learning new things all the time. Um, I mean, it wasn't fun getting beat up by Dan, but you know, that was just part of the learning process. Dan's like wrestling a bag of hammers. He'll come at you 16 ways from Sunday. Oh, he, he's, uh, he's terrible. Yeah, he's terrible. <laughs> Did you think his career would extend to that which we've seen? I mean, he has been in this sport for greater than two decades. and, uh, I, I, and I don't think anyone knew what would happen. You know, he, he entered the sport when it was still so new. It wasn't even a sport. And his goal was, hey, I can make some money so I can train wrestling. That was his thought. He just wanted to be able to wrestle. Right. So he um, he did that tournament. He won, and then other opportunities started popping up. And then uh, I remember him before he entered the King of Kings tournament. It was a heavyweight tournament, and he's walking around weighing 190 pounds. I'm like, why are you doing a heavyweight tournament? He's like, well, I can win two hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, but you got to beat a bunch of heavyweights. <laughs> you don't care. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, well. Who cares? If I lose, I lose. Otherwise, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and he's just, you know, Dan's just a real special kind of guy. He's such a competitor, you know, and, uh, you know, he, he won that. It just opened a lot of doors for him and, uh, you know, but no one knew where the sport was going to go at that time. I was talking with Big Bob Sapp on Friday night, and uh, there are guys that are, are featured 
acts, if you will, uh, that will show up and maybe take a round or two and win or lose. You know, they're going to get paid. But guys like Henderson are, are the lunchbox guys. They bring their lunchbox to work and they work hard. And you've been that guy, too. I mean, you take a look at your victories, wins and losses within mixed martial arts. I go back to Bruno, Paul Gardner, Antonio McKee, Yuki Sasaki, Koji Oisha, uh, Brad Gum. I, I, I had no easy fights, that's for sure. You, I, no, I got, there I were no easy you, fights. You want me to fight? You're going to pay me some money? Okay, I'm going. Yeah, there were no easy fights there. So, but, you know, if, if your MMA career says anything, it's a direct reference, if you will. It's a reflection of your overall career in the arts. And I'm talking about from wrestling to MMA. Your career has not been easy. You didn't give up. You stopped. You know, like I said, you've thrown in the towel a couple times, but you picked up that towel of your own volition. And if there's anything we can get from the Heath Sims story is that there's always that second chance. And you believed in yourself, and you started having fun again. And now as a coach, you're still having fun. You're, you're expressing and passing on your knowledge to, to those guys that need it. Uh, it's got to be at least satisfying. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, knowing that uh, I can take all the knowledge I've learned over 30 years and, and be able to pass it on to other people that want to learn it. You know, it's not like I'm not trying to force anything on someone. If someone wants to learn it and they're hungry to learn, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great feeling to be able to, to share what I know and help other people. Were you the original Huntington Beach bad boy? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you went to Woodbridge High, and you're from Huntington Beach. And um, I, I, maybe Chell son can, can make that claim to the moniker, but, dude, you've been scary for a while. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> there were guys that did not want to fight you and the guys that did not want to wrestle you. And, and I don't know that it was all about the hair or lack of it, but it was, I think, more than anything, it was about your style. You had that Greco style. And uh, you've absolutely represented our nurse sport well. I'm so glad to be able to reconnect with you. Uh, even in Singapore, you've had a late class. What time is it there now? Uh, it's about 10.30 at night now. 10.30 at night. What time will you begin tomorrow? Um, I'm not working tomorrow. I'm actually off tomorrow. But um, I'll, I'll, I'll teach about, it, it varies, but, um, you know, four, four, five, six classes a day. So there's kind of spread out through the day. Like I said, the gym is uh, the gym opens at 6:30 first class and closes oh. at 11 o'clock at night, and they have classes all day long. You know, and Greg, we have three locations here in Singapore, so I I, I bounce, you know, from each each location. You keep busy, that's for sure. Uh, if I can say anything, Heath, first of all, thank you for the time today, or tonight, as it were. Uh, putting in the Nike hot seat was the decision. I actually searched for you. I wanted to talk to you because I knew the story. I knew your story, and, and perhaps we're only touching on the tip of the iceberg, but uh, Greco-Roman is where it's at today because of guys like you, guys that chose it. Now it's becoming an option for freestylers, and, and Greco guys will go freestyle, or freestyle guys will go Greco, if only to make that Olympic team or world team, and we're seeing more and more of it. And because of you, we're seeing uh, more guys do that. And we appreciate you taking the time to talk about it. But more than anything, you're choosing to express it and coach it on a world level. We appreciate that. Thank you so much for taking the time live from Singapore, our guest in the Nike hot seat today. Uh, just on an off chance, is there anybody you want to give a shout-out to here uh, stateside? Um, no, you know, with the good thing about living far away, with technology now, it's like you're down the street. I, sometimes I think I talk to people more often living farther away than I did when I was close. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm in constant contact with my friends and everybody, and it's uh, it's like they're down the street. So, yeah, no problem. <laughs> one of my favorite Greco-Roman wrestlers, one of my favorite Olympians of all time, Heath Sims, has been our guest on the Nike Hot Seat today. I'm Scott Casper. Thanks for watching.